uh, president of the LSA. And I wanted to start by saying you're sitting here at a truly historic event, the inaugural lecture of the Charles Fillmore Professorship to be delivered by my Stanford colleague, Dan Jurafsky. So no matter how many more institutes are held, reaching as far into the future as Pluto is from Earth, <laughs> there will never be another inaugural Fillmore lecture. <laughs> and you were here, are here. So please give yourselves and Dr. Liddy Wong Fillmore a hand in this group. So I'll say a little bit of introduction to both of them. Uh, before doing that, I want to say a few words on behalf of the LSA. Of course, I'd like to thank uh, the Institute Directors, Carlos Oregui and Helen Liu, as well as Admin Director, Laura Stomp Catasanto, who's ready to thank, for all they did to facilitate our participation in this event's proceedings. Now, the LSA is pleased to serve as a primary sponsor for the Linguistic Institute, an event society has been organizing since 1928, one year before Chuck Fillmore was born. It was conceived by the founders of the LSA to complement to the linguistics programs that are offered by colleges and universities throughout the world. So at the time of the LSA's founding, um, no single degree program could make a credible claim to covering the entire scope of the emerging field of linguistics. <coughs> Probably no institution can still do that today, but even less so then. So they used to have, at first, a very intensive six to 10 week um, institute, which was nurtured by the leading lights of the field. Indeed, two days ago, um, Mark Lieberman reprinted in Language Log, for those of you who follow uh, Language Log faithfully, an account of the development of the LSA from 1924 to 1950 by Martin Joost that describes early institutes from 1928 to 31. The 1928 institute, the very first one, for instance, included 23 faculty and 43 students or registrants. Uh, in fact, many of the courses only had one or two. A couple had none. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, total expenses uh, over 10 weeks of $6,144.52. Um, so even though, of course, there were only a few registrants, and by the way, they list the names of everybody who was there and the courses they took, so we could tell which of those registrants were slackers and which ones were really working hard. So. <coughs> Anyhow, it's, it's just kind of grown and prospered over the years then the role of the LSA in sponsoring it has also grown. We typically provide a major planning grant to the host institution. We try to help to ensure the quality and rigor of the courses. And among other things, we manage the student fellowship competition. And many people consider the institute the LSA's signal event. But um, of course, we do a lot more than sponsor the institute. Uh, we have an outstanding publications program that you all, all know about, not only including things like language, but um, our book access journal, semantics and pragmatics, a, a range of conference proceedings, and a number of archival materials that are published under the auspices of e-language. And as you know, our annual meeting is also a big event that attracts lots of people. Um, so if you're not already a member of the LSA, um, then <laughs> I invite you to join us today. And, um, uh, as the meet, wanted me to tell you that there is a discount coupon in your packets which can be used over the next few weeks of the Institute. Also want to make a plug for some of these focus groups that we're having at this Institute. Um, one tomorrow morning at 7.30, and one on Sunday morning at 7.30. I mean, on Sunday morning at 7.30. Um, they're going to be in Stuart Hall, and there's a, it's an opportunity for you to tell us how the LSA is serving your needs and how we can better do that. Um, Ivy Hauser, who is a student member of the um, LSA Executive Committee. Is Ivy here? No. Hi, Ivy. Can you stand a moment? Um, she's currently pursuing her PhD at UMass, and she's the recipient of the prestigious LSA Block Fellowship at this institute. Um, she's going to be doing a, a group primarily for students, which will serve pizza as a guest, whatever we have tomorrow morning, uh, in the same place on Monday at 7 p.m. So we had a free sign up list, but um, you know, if you uh, didn't sign up, just come along and we'll do the whole kind of bread and fish, loaves, loaves and fish uh, uh, thing and try to make sure you get something. In any case, just come. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the LSA is pleased to provide funding from an endowment to support the named professorships at the Institute, often in memory of Herman Collins, um, 
who was one of the first instructors, by the way, that I'm reflecting on this today, uh, Edward Sapir and Ken Hill. The newest such professorship, the Tillmo professorship, is made possible by the scholar I'm about to introduce, Lily Wang Kirkman. She's now the Jerome A. Ito Professor Emerita of Education at the University of California at Berkeley. And she graduated with a PhD in linguistics from Stanford in 1976 with a dissertation entitled The Second Time Around, Cognitive and Social Strategies in Second Language Acquisition. Interestingly enough, we both attended a sociolinguistics institute at Stanford in the summer of 1970. I was a lowly undergraduate from UC Santa Cruz. She was in the early years of the graduate program. And we worked together on a word association study in East Palo Alto. The main thing I remember is that we asked a kid, uh, Mexican-American, uh, Mexican-American family with a son of a migrant worker, when we gave him the word um, car, he said, home, which really, really struck us. And I guess about everything else we did that summer, that's one of the main things we remember. But she's since then gone on to become a very influential scholar in the fields of language, culture, society, education, and literacy, especially in relation to language minority students in American schools. Last year, she made a generous request in honor of her late husband, Dr. Charles J. Fillmore, the distinguished linguist and the 1991 president of the LSA. We've invited her tonight to share with you a few thoughts about her husband's legacy. But before she takes the podium, I'd like to invite you all to also consider making a contribution to support the Fillmore Student Fellowship, which was also started in 2014. We're still in the middle of our campaign to raise $50,000 to endow a student fellowship in perpetuity. Donations can be made online, and I've been asked to say, you can hand me a check. <laughs> Please help me welcome Dr. Lady Bong. If I stood behind here, you would see only a cowl there. But, uh, so I'll just try to show you there is a person here, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for this opportunity to say a few words about Charles Fillmore and about why the Linguistic Society of uh, Summer Institute is an appropriate venue for a lasting memorial to his endeavors in linguistic studies. For those of you who aren't familiar with his work, Charles Fillmore, known as Chuck, was a linguist whose interest in language was broad and inclusive in scope. There was a time when linguistic research was focused tightly on syntax and considerations of meaning or of secondary rather than of primary concern. Because he was interested in, with, uh, in language understanding, Fillmore's inquiries into syntax quickly led him to explore the nexus of structure and meaning. His studies on case began with efforts to characterize the configuration of deep case uh, semantic roles associated with various verbs and their influence on the underlying grammatical organization of sentences they appear in. His work on case grammar, together with his later lexical research, led him to distinguish what he described as cognitive frames from linguistic frames, linguistic frames in his words, the idea being that cognitive frames are those background understandings needed for making sense of things that happen around us. And linguistic frames are those that are specifically coded in or evoked by lexical units or other features of linguistic form. He described the distinction in this way. When humans face particular situations, they can invoke frames from their personal <coughs> mental inventory of frames to make sense of those situations. The words we encounter can evoke frames by virtue of their conventional associations with them. Bill Moore's work on case grammar, on language and context, and on lexical semantics led eventually to frame semantics. He noticed the configurations of case roles indexed or framed in different types of situations, leading him to conclude that linguistic meaning is better considered from the point of view of the concepts present in the minds of the speaker and aroused in the minds of the addressee 
than from prevailing um, ways of dealing with meaning. His quest was always to understand the workings of linguistic knowledge and communication and comprehension. What shapes and frames the way someone communicates an idea or thought in a given context? And how does the recipient of that communicate, interpret, and understand what has been said? How we understand a tweet, how do we, uh, or how we in interpret a tweeted message such as, I spent three hours on land this afternoon versus one that says, I spent three hours on the ground this afternoon, depends on our recognition of the frames evoked by phrases on land and on the ground. Both refer to being on terra firma, but as he showed us, um, two distinct frames are involved, one on land, featuring travel by water, the other on the ground, travel by air. Fillmore was deeply aware of the messiness of the maximalist stance that he took on communicative intention and language interpretation. His perspective on language was the antithesis of the minimalist uh, project, you might say. But by sharing that perspective with students and colleagues, Fillmore made it possible for others to gain a greater understanding of how language works. At Fillmore's memorial at the Berkeley campus last year, Kathy O'Connor, who was at Boston University, described the experience of working with him on various projects by comparing it to an actual journey. She wrote, it's as though you are on a trip together, caught up in the minutia of travel. The roller bag isn't working, you're in danger of missing the train, it's too hot, and so forth. And then your travel companion says, look, if you stand over here, look at what you can see. And suddenly you're taken out of your little world of exasperating details, and you see a panoramic and beautiful view right there where you're standing. And it's beautiful and consequential at the same time. Suddenly, with Chuck, you'd be gazing out into the complexity of the universe that is language. Charles Fillmore's work in syntax, pragmatics, frame semantics, lexicography, and construction grammar led eventually to the, the development of FrameNet, a lexical data re, uh, resource for corpus-based studies of nat natural language processing. The ultimate goal of these endeavors was, in his words, to be able to understand everything that can be known about a word or a sentence or speaker's knowledge of their language. And he recognized that this was a goal that could probably never be achieved because the further he delved into the workings of language and the mind, the more layers of complexity he found, but it didn't stop him from trying. What he demonstrated is that any amount of what, <clears throat> any account of what it means to know a language has got to go way beyond knowledge of word meaning and grammatical knowledge needed to combine those words into phrases and sentences in the language. And that's his legacy. His work over the years has transformed the theoretical study of language and has provided a framework for exploring construct construction, theoretic approaches to linguistic analysis in many languages. Okay, so that was Charles Fillmore, but why a Fillmore professorship at the LSA Institute? In Julia Falk's presentation at last year's symposium com commemorating the 90th anniversary of the LSA, she mentioned that in surveys over the years, LSA members consider the uh, linguistic institutes to be the society's most important service to the profession. The LSA Summer Institutes has been a gathering for scholars for the interchange of ideas over the years just as they were pitched to the society in 1928. In those days, programs of linguistic studies were mostly attached to departments of anthropology, language and literacy, such as English, German, or French. Uh, course offerings in linguistic studies could be described as slim pickings. <laughs> as an undergraduate study, a student of linguistics at the University of Minnesota, Phil Moore's program was built around two four texts, both entitled, entitled Language, one by Sapir, the other by Bloomfield, with studies of Latin, 
Arabic and various uh, Slavic languages filling out the study list. That wouldn't have added up to much of a program in linguistics had it not been for opportunities to attend LSSA summer institutes, first in Ann Arbor and then Glory B in Berkeley in 1951. Berkeley was an especially memorable and, and heady experience for a young Minnesotan, not quite from Lake Wobegon, but close. <laughs> um, meeting and schmoozing with people from all over the country who were thinking, talking, living, breathing, and quaffing linguistics. He studied Thai with Mary Haas, Sanskrit with Franklin Edgerton, and Navajo with uh, uh, Harry Hoyer, and got a glimpse into the vast differences in how concepts and ideas can be expressed across languages. Chuck regarded his participation in LSA Summer Institutes both as a student and later as an instructor, an essential part of him, his becoming a linguist and member of the, of the linguistic community. For him, teaching in the institutes was not work. It was summer camp, where he could catch up with friends and colleagues, renew his enthusiasm for studying language, and hear from the up and coming young people. He talked a lot about the young people and how important a part they were in the field. And that's why a fellow more professorship at the LSA Summer Institute seemed to be an appropriate way to remember Chuck's lifelong work on empirically challenging linguistic phenomena and the careful description of language. It has been my hope that the Fillmore Professorship would recognize individuals whose research reflects an exceptional understanding of language, shows promise of making a lasting contribution uh, to the, its study, and promote the synthesis of linguistic theory with interdependent disciplines, such as computational linguistics, cognitive science, and yes, education too. I can't think of anyone who meets these criteria better than Dan Jarofsky. I thank those of you who selected him as a first Fillmore professor. Chuck was very fond of Dan, and I know that wherever he is right now, he's smiling at the choice and eager to hear from Dan what Dan has to say. Thank you. He also supervised his senior honors thesis on the syntax of the comparative construction. So you can see it, 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 it he was the perfect person to, um, to be the first film of lecture. Um, Dan went on to do his PhD at Berkeley in computer science, 1992. Then he did a postdoc in computer science there until 1995. He then joined the faculty of the University of Colorado, and in 2003, he became professor of linguistics in Vicorice Computer Science on Stanford. Now, Dan's research ranges widely across computational linguistics, and his special interests include natural language understanding, machine translation, spoken language and conversation, the relationship between human and machine processing, and the application of natural language processing to the social and behavioral sciences. He also works in the linguistics of food, and the linguistics of Chinese. So you may already know a few other things about Dan, um, like the fact that he developed a two-week course here on computational Lexical semantics, that he's the author of a J.H. Martin of Speech and Language Processing, which is the required text for Sharon Goldwater's Introduction to Computational Linguistics, or that he's a dynamite drummer who performs with dead tongues, the standard band in the people that he speak. So from these snippets of information, you would gather that he's a Renaissance man uh, with more energy and more weary talents than the average person. Uh, 
and you'd be right. So the, the continuing the stream, he once played a corpse in a uh, Puccini opera, for instance. <laughs> but then again, he was also the winner of a MacArthur Genius Award um, in 2003. And of the many accomplishments on Dan CV, like his six books and numerous referee articles, the one that particularly struck me is the number of best paper awards he and his co authors have won. These include one from the Association for Computational Linguistics in 2006, one from the International Worldwide Conference and Worldwide Web Conference in 2013, another the same year at the Empirical Methods of Natural Language Processing Conference, and another just this year, the Gould Prize from the American Sociological Association for a co authored paper on social bonding courtship situation, which I guess writes up with the speed dating now. His 2014 book on the language of food, the output of a very popular undergraduate seminar, was also a finalist for the prestigious James Beard Award. In this film or lecture tonight, he will combine his love of computational linguistics and his love of food. Please help me welcome Dan to the podium to talk about the computational linguistics of food, innovation, start with Chuck Fillmore. And, um, and so what, what Fillmore called his program in empirical semantics, the idea he had was to study the meanings that lie behind a speaker's use of words. And I want to call out two particular aspects of this work. One is his emphasizing what he called the continuity between language and experience. He was really interested in that. And his idea of drawing on other disciplines. He was very influenced by cognitive science and by computer science. So you can think of a lot of the questions Chuck asked as, as um, aspects of this one question. What can we learn from words, their meanings, their uses, and their users? And I want to take off from here, and I particularly want to um, draw my inspiration from Fillmore's famous um, comment in his um, very influential paper in 1976 proposing that we study the semantics of frames about the linguistics of breakfast. And he said, um, he noticed this, this sentence, the Wangs had chicken soup for breakfast. And he said, breakfast here carries with it a particular background assumption that we know that there are three meals in the day and breakfast is the first one. But we can use breakfast in a completely different way, he noticed. Breakfast served any time. And here, breakfast means the kind of the, the pancakes and the waffles and the, and the eggs that we have in the morning. So that these background frames that let us understand these two meanings of breakfast are themselves an important object of study. We need to understand the meanings behind the, the individual meanings we use for words. And so I want to take off both from this idea of looking for meanings behind words and for um, beginning with the linguistics of food. Um, and I want to start by talking about the ketchup model of scientific innovation. And so I want to just spend um, five minutes taking you back about 2,000 years. Imagine that you're a um, Fishermen, you're speaking Mon Khmer or Tai Kadai or Hong Yan, you're in Southeast China, what's now Southeast China, um, Southeast Asia, you're fishing in fresh water. The, what do you do in the dry season to preserve your fish? You layer your salted fish in jars, you layer it with salt and then with cooked rice in between, you wait for lactic acid fermentation to take place, and um, your fish turns into this lovely, salty, briny, um, fermented product. And we know this because it's mentioned in. Um, early Chinese ethnologies and um, linguistic anthropologists have found it still made by um, Thai-speaking tribes up in the hill parts of, of western Guangxi. So then about, uh, about um, uh, 200 BC, China expands into the south. Um, in the Han Dynasty, um, uh, the Chinese empire expands into, what's, into Guangdong and Fujian, the southern parts of China. Locals are assimilated. These seafoods spread throughout China. They spread all the way to Japan, where this fermented fish and rice um, becomes the ancestor of sushi, technically called narazushi, this um, fermented fish and rice dish. And then by the 18th century, this dish is modified. Instead of lactic acid, sour, fermented, goopy rice, we instead um, just add some vinegar to fresh rice and we have a delicious, fresh product. And by the time of refrigeration 
and ice come around, we have fresh fish. Meanwhile, back in China, <laughs> fish products are made all around Southeast Asia and China, and, um, and southern Chinese Fujianese and Cantonese sailors are sailing all around Southeast Asia, bringing back fish sauce products, for example, which are made in Vietnam and Cambodia. I've shown you on the left a bottle of fish sauce. And they also use a paste made from the, the um, red rice, the leaves made from red rice, Hong Zhao. That's a picture in the, in the center of Hong Zhao. It's like a, it's the stuff at the bottom when you make rice, when you make wine out of red rice. And you can make a lovely um, chicken dish out of this, which I recommend highly. Uh, anyway, as they're sailing around, the southern Chinese settle and help propagate these fish sauces throughout Southeast Asia. I've shown you in little stars here um, um, areas of large um, ethnic Chinese settlement throughout Southeast Asia. And what quickly developed is um, what I call the fish soy fermentation isoglots. <laughs> so to the north of this line, people eat fermented soy products. To the south of this line, fermented fish products. And you can see that southern China lies right at the boundary of this isoglots. <laughs> this is um, me on my um, uh, honeymoon um, uh, with my wife Janet, who's somewhere, somewhere back there. Um, uh, uh, um, at a fish sauce fermentation factory in the south part of Vietnam. Anyway, so we've got all these um, Chinese settlements, fish sauce making, and then the Europeans arrive. 1600, the British, the Dutch, they're going to Asia, colonizing and looking for spices and textiles and porcelain. And imagine you're a sailor on this ship. What do you drink? It's hard to find fresh water. You drink beer and wine. And um, those go sour in the heat of this um, of this. Uh, tropical crossing because hops, although it had been invented and the Dutch have hops in their beer, the British are very conservative and this you know, newfangled continental hops, they don't believe in it yet. Um, so there's no hops, so the beer goes bad. And they get to Indonesia and they're very excited to find ethnic Chinese making Eric. Eric is the ancestor of rum, it's distilled palm wine and that same red rice that they were using for cooking, they distill it into liquor. The word comes from the Arabic word for sweat. Um, because of the distillation, you know, the, the, the alcohol, you boil the alcohol, you put a pot over it, and the, the alcohol distills, sweats off of the lid. Anyway, there's a picture of some, some Arab. So the British start buying it by 1609. By 1704, it's the common drink of Europeans in Asia. Sailors add lines that they're taking for scurvy, and they invent punch, the world's first cocktail. So the British, very excited to be buying this Arab, and while they're there, they pick up some fish sauce. And it's not called what we call fish sauce now, milk mom or or non um, it was um, in the local, the southern Min, that's the, the, um, the Minanhua, the southern um, Fujianese dialect, Zhangzhou dialect, fish sauce was called ge duck, ge an old word for salted fish, and duck a word for sauce, and the British bring this ketchup home. And we know this because we can um, read the um, accounts of, of British traders um, East India Company traders to, to Asia, and um, they're all on the web. And you can see that ketchup, which is the word at the time for fish sauce, was an important commodity. And in fact, um, you can read about the details. Soy comes in tubs from Japan, the best ketchup from Tonkin, northern Vietnam. Um, yet good of both sorts are made and sold very cheap in China. So he's buying a lot of this stuff in Hong Kong. And he also says, I know not a more profitable commodity. <laughs> um, so what do you do when you have a expensive imported luxury? They're bringing bottles all the way to Asia, filling them with fish sauce, bringing them back to England. Um, you have an expensive product, of course you create fakes. So very quickly, <laughs> there are knockoff ketchups. Here's a recipe for a knockoff ketchup made from beer and mace and cloves and pepper, very European. And notice the line at the bottom, thought to exceed what is brought from India, India the word for Asia at the time. So they're clearly trying to imitate this superior Asian imported product. But the product changes very quickly. So by 1800, there's a walnut ketchup. This is Jane Austen's family recipe for walnut ketchup. Involved, you can see another European. It's got vinegar, it's got nutmeg, it's got ginger, a little horseradish. And then by the 1800s, tomatoes arrive from the New World, and you get a tomato ketchup. So still not our modern sweet ketchup. This is a salty ketchup with, with a quarter of a pound of anchovies and shallots and black pepper and so on. Um, and then sugar, sugar becomes much cheaper, and um, anchovies seem to disappear from the recipe. And by 1870, we get a lot of sugar, and we end up with our modern um, to, uh, really, it's a tomato chutney is what a modern ketchup is. <laughs> so um, the idea of ketchup is it's not just a food. It's a, it's a metaphor. Um, if you think about, the, about ketchup, um, 
all of these recipes in the history of ketchup, we began with a, a Thai tribal fermented fish sauce, and it became a sushi, and it became a, it became a Vietnamese fish sauce, and then in Europe it became an anchovy and a mushroom and a walnut sauce. Um, each of these is, is a, uh, a recipe is an algorithm for making a food. And each of these algorithms changed over time as people borrowed their neighbor's algorithms and modified them slightly. So the ketchup theory of innovation suggests that innovation happens when we go over to our neighbors, maybe because we're trying to colonize them or, or you know, enslave them or something, but <laughs> along the way, we take their food home. And, um, <laughs> and we, we, we mess with it and we improve it. So I want to apply the ketchup theory of innovation first um, to a computational idea. I want to look at how we can study innovation in the history of science by using computational linguistics. And this is um, this is joint work with Ashton Anderson, Dan McFarland, David Hall, and Chris Mann. So innovation in science, if you look at most historical accounts of scientific change, um, historians of science focus a lot on internal revolution. How it is that, that, um, um, that we have a paradigm in the field, and then because of internal revolution, we create a new paradigm. And I want to focus right now instead on external influences. What's the role of borrowing from your neighbors that we saw with ketchup? Um, and we do this by looking at one field as an exemplar field. We look at computational linguistics, which has the advantage that all the papers are online, and we're very lazy and teased to find them when they're online. Um, and uh, the, the other thing about them being online is that someone's built a beautiful citation graph, so you can see which papers cite whom. And so we have all 20,000 papers over the last 40 or 50 years, and all of the authors all identified, and the citations. And we use a model called topic models, Topic models, or latent Dirichlet allocation, is an extension of the vector or distributed semantics I've been talking about in class, um, an idea really due to Zellig Harris in 1954, um, in a very famous um, set of ideas. Uh, basically, I, you know, all of computational linguistics comes from Zellig Harris. You can ask me about that in the question session. But, um, but including this idea of, of inducing the meaning of a word by looking at its lexical environment. So topic models are just clusters of words that code co-occur together and uh, suggest ideas or topics or sub-areas. So we can take a bunch of papers and run these automatically inducing topic models, and we can learn um, topics like anaphora or parsing or machine translation, and each paper, a little row there in that little matrix is a paper, each paper is some distribution over topics. A paper is about different ideas. And we ran this on the, this topic modeling on the anthology and came up with 73 topics, 73 distributions over words, so topics like an after resolution or probability theory or parsing and so on. Some of the words in our, in our topics. Um, and we can then ask, for a given year, what topics are people working on? So I'm just summing over all years of the probability of topics in all the papers. And here's a graph of two particular topics, one older method, um, uh, that was very popular in 1980. This is a method. Of, this is a story understanding topic. And this is a method actually of, of um, my advisor's advisor. And then, um, and then you can see the rise of topics of this new statistical topic. This is the probability in blue and statistical topic. And if we look at where this new statistical topic, this, these statistical tools that transformed computational linguistics right around 1988. Um, um, we look at that knee in the curve in 1988, you can see the rise happens right there. We call that the, st the statistical revolution in computational linguistics. And we, we can ask what happened in 1988. We, we've discovered something happened in 1988. So we looked at all the papers in 1988 that were highly loaded on this topic, papers that had lots of these new statistical words. So here are the papers that appear in 1988, a, a stochastic parts program, a stochastic approach to language translation, and so on. And it turns out that all of those papers came from Bell Laboratories, IBM Laboratories, so I put some of the authors over here. Basically, all of them came from speech researchers with electrical engineering background. So in other words, um, in 1988, speech researchers brought the ideas to computational linguistics. Computational linguistics linguist borrowed this, new, these new models and applied them to new problems. So we see the ketchup model of innovation in action. The, the technology was just borrowed from neighbors and reinvented. And I want to I want to just spend spend two minutes talking about some more details of that. Because the problem with just looking at topic models is, I claim somebody was working on a topic, some topic appeared in some year, and, they were, and then in a, in a different year, some other topic occurred. So 
papers were about this topic, and then later papers were about that topic. But I'd really rather follow individual authors. What do authors do when they're working on one topic? How do they get to work on another topic? So we'd like to instead look at topics that people are working on in, say, one year, like 20, 2002, and then the same people, what are they working on in 2003? How do, how do ideas propagate through people? So we'd like to look at people through time. And we did this with the same um, corpus by clustering topics. Now we're clustering them based on how people move in and out of them. And we ended up with nine clusters. These are topics that are similar, these are meta topics of nine topics of the 73 little fine grain topics grouped into nine topics such that those topics have some kind of coherence in people moving in them and people moving out of them. People tend to move into them together and move out of them together. And here's the nine topics organized by time period. So we have to uh, topics from the, in the 80s, early language understanding topics and early parsing topics and automata topics. And then we have this weird period in the middle that I've called the bake-off period. Bake-offs are government-sponsored required annual evaluations in computational linguistics that people who have certain grants are required to show up at a workshop and present their results. And these were very popular um, and very required from 1989 to 1994. And then after 1995, we have these modern probabilistic topics for the last, you know, the last 20 years or so, um, uh, big data topics and probabilistic models and, and our various linguistic supervised classification models. And if we look at, let's look at a, I'm gonna show you a little graph of these, these nine clusters. And I want you to read them from left to right. I've shown you the nine clusters on the left from the first four years, how people are moving in topics from 1980 through to 1984. And each node, the size of the node is how many people are working on that topic. And the arrows are the, the number of people who move from one topic to another. So up there in the upper left, early NLU, people are working on early understanding. NLU is natural language understanding. People are working on early topics in, in this field and they're, and they're continually, the, there's a thick arrow because they're continually working on that topic. And then something happens but around 1988, right in the middle, people start moving to this government topic, this middle topic. And you see big thick arrows moving in that direction. And from that topic, they then um, move out to other topics by about 1980. And I call this the hourglass model because people were working on lots of things and then they're forced by the government to work, to all work together at a particular um, period. They have to show up at this workshop and present their papers and learn from each other. And then um, people learn all of these different models and they, and they spread out and, and these models propagate through the field. Um, so this topic, this, this funnel of the hourglass, um, um, was a required meeting by various grants, and it caused these speech people and these text people all to meet each other. Um, computer scientists and linguists saw a bunch of electrical engineers presenting um, probabilistic papers and borrowed the math, and these innovations got replicated. And we can watch the field converge by taking these same topics and projecting them onto two dimensions. We talked about projecting onto two dimensions in, in my class. Um, and so these, here's three lines I'm colorblind, but that's, let's call that blue, and let's call that red, and let's call that one some other color. And, um, and so that's the, that's the three conferences, and the blue conference is the new um, statistical empirical conference. And so you can see that conferences were moving around in topic space over time, and then um, ended up right over by this, the, the, the topics of the new conference. So this new conference appears and people start moving in what they, the kind of things they publish in and the kind of work they do slowly toward this new conference. And we can even see um, uh, how people enter and leave the field. This is a graph of people, um, uh, of if you published in year X, did you also publish in year X plus one? This is the retention of authors in the field of, over time. So you can see that people, if at, over time, people tend to stay in the conferences more. They're more likely to keep publishing in the conference, except for that blip in the middle. The blip in the middle, that's the bake off years. That's all those electrical engineers who showed up, wrote their papers, and went home. <laughs> uh, so they, they uh, we call it the pollination model. They appeared, they pollinated um, the field with this particular new models. Um, and then they all went back and did their electrical engineering. So in summary, this 
the government-sponsored period led an influx of people who presented a bunch of ideas and then went home. Um, so, um, so what we've done is use the language, use words and their clustering and their co-occurrences to define an innovation and then trace people by how they move through these topics to find the causal pattern. And we found um, evidence for the catch-up theory. It's people who came from a neighboring field, but they didn't colonize the field. It's not like people show up in a new field and then, and then you know, switch departments and work on this new thing. They just suggest an idea and then they go home. And it's also, here's a, a very important success role for government funding. Here's a case where government funding led to collaboration and shared problems and the spreading of ideas. All right, so that's scientific innovation. I wanna now uh, talk about linguistic innovation. Um, and this is um, uh, work with Christian Dennis, Nicholas Gumazil, that's one person, Robert West, um, and um, Yuri Leskovitz, and Chris Potts. Um, and I want to start with two mysteries of language change drawn from the sociolinguistic literature. So I have a, a graph here from Sally Romani. So here's this fact that adolescents are known to be very innovative linguistically, especially women. So there's, this is a graph showing um, a, 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 a probability of adopting a new innovation by age group, and you can see a big peak around, around you know, 19 plus or minus five or something. So why is it that there is this peak of creating and adopting innovation among adolescents? And you could say, well, it's obvious it's about social identity, or maybe it's obvious it's about rebellion, or maybe it's obvious it's about the biological critical period, but we don't really know for sure. Um, and there's a related fact, um, which uh, adult language stability, this fact that after about 30, our language starts to change much slower. Um, and, um, Again, we don't know a lot about this. Is this a biological fact? Is it about memory? Um, and we don't even know for sure if adults are really stable. There's some lovely um, work, work um, by Sankoff questioning exactly how stable adults are. We don't really know. So we like to study this. And um, the best way to study this is to follow people around with microphones for 50 years. <laughs> and that's the correct thing to do, and I'm just lazy. So better for lazy people is go online and get the complete historical record of some online community and see if we see the same patterns in the online community. So that's what we did. We took um, 4.5 million beer reviews from two <laughs> beer rater sites collected by uh, my friend Julie McCauley, um, and that has 10 years of posts. People join these communities for 10 years. There's hundreds of millions of words. And the way beer review, those of you who um, have ever looked at Beer Advocate or rate beer work, is um, these are communities. People are friends with each other. They comment on each other's um, reviews. And the way they write a review, the interface is set up. You're looking at other people's reviews of the same beer, and you write your own little review of that beer. Here's a sample beer review that people write. I'll let you read it, because it's very fun. This is a negative, a negative review, in case you were not sure. <laughs> Okay. All right, so we're going to use how these change over time to look at especially lexical changes and some structural changes. So here's an example of a small change in a convention. This is really a, a lexical change. This is a kind of a change in a convention. Um, people used to, when they're describing the smell of a beer, at, they used to write the word aroma before their sentence describing the smell of a beer, and they switched at some point in the community to writing the letter S for smell. Mm -hmm. So the convention in this field changed at some point. And you can see in this graph the rise and fall of these conventions. So in 2000, people began to talk about aroma, and then something happened around 2006, and it flipped, and people instead began to use the word smell. <coughs> All right, a, ch a changing convention. And first of all, we can see that it's younger speakers who adopt these innovations. So imagine that you're a user who joined in 2003. So you, you're an old, this is an old user, somebody who joined at the beginning, they're old in the age of the community, they adopt the Aroma Convention, the Blue Convention, and they just keep using it more and more. They ignore these new smell upstarts. <laughs> Whereas if you're a younger user, you joined in 2005, just as this new convention is taking off, you're gonna, you're gonna adopt this lovely new smell convention and, and, and ignore this um, old-fashioned aroma convention. So um, these in innovations happen, uh, younger speakers tend to adopt them, and we can also look at the change over time of speaker's language and community language. So here's looking at, at um, 
at the reviews of, along the x-axis is the, the number of reviews in individual rights over time. The y-axis is their, 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 their usage of, in the left graph, the first person pronoun. How often do they talk about themselves? Declines over time. How often do they use beer jargon, like the word lacing or the word retention, that rises over time? So people are changing their patterns of usage as they participate in the community. And the community is also changing. So it just happens that over time, the use of fruit words increased in the community. And various lexical innovations were created in the community. People talked about sandalwood or verdict, or talked about the, the word mysterious became popular, and so on. And our idea is, let's look at this, these two kinds of innovations. People are changing. The community is changing. Let's look at the link between them. So here's the community changing over time. People are coming and going from this community. And individuals are joining the community. We can imagine they're joining as young people in the community. And they spend their lifestyle in the life stage in the life cycle in the community. And then they leave. The, they abandon. At some point, they, they stop posting on this blog and they go home. And we can measure. <laughs> how similar a user is to their community at any point in time. And um, um, we do this, never mind the math, but we do it's cross entropy of language models. How similar are the words they use to the words of the community? And so along the x-axis, I have your life stage. For on average, you join the community at life stage zero and you finish at life stage 100%. How similar is your language that I see have done distance? How far away is how you write in terms of um, words or pairs of words or triples of words from the community. And you start out pretty distant from the community and you slowly become more and more similar to the community over time. And then slowly at the end you get less similar to the community. So you can think about this as two stages. Um, I start out by, I'm learning the language of the community, I'm learning these words like retention and lacing, these technical beer terms. And then somehow I, I, I start drifting away from the community. My language changes from the community. Um, and then I die. <laughs> All right, so why would this be? Why do users get more distant from the community? And you can imagine two hypotheses. Well, maybe I'm adopting fabulous new innovative language, but the community's just ignoring me. Um, they don't like me. Um, or um, it could be that I stop adopting language, I just freeze, and I get out of tune, and the community is still changing, but I'm just not keeping up with it. And um, let's look at some evidence. It's gonna, it's, I'm going to argue for a hypothesis, too, but I'm going to show you some evidence. Um, so first is I can ask, how similar is how I talk, how I, the language of my post, to my previous post? Um, so it's, technically, it's the self-similarity. And you can see that over t at the beginning, um, I'm not very similar to myself. But over time, my language gets, very, gets more and more similar to my previous language. So my language is more changeable at the beginning. And then over time, I kind of plateau off. I'm getting, I, I go to a high level of similarity. So my language becomes um, more similar to what I, what I said before. We can also measure, does the post, do the post that I write, do they look more like the language of the past, or do they look more like the language of the future? So I, um, I can just measure. Um, who am I most like if I write a post? Is that post, on average, more like the posts a year ago or more like the posts that will be in the future a year from now? So am I more of a progressive user of language or a more conservative user of language? And again, over the lifestyle, life cycle, life stage of any individual writer, they start out being progressive. Young writers write like the future, and they end up being conservative. Old writers write like the past. So somehow their, their language here is predict is is predicting what the future of the community will look like, and by the end, it's looking like the past. Or I can measure, if somebody invents a new lexical innovation, uses a new word that hasn't been used in this community yet, and, and it, maybe it's going to catch on, um, how likely am I to adopt this innovation? So here's the probability of my adopting an innovation over time, starting at the at early life stage and going to the end of my life in the community. And you can see that, uh, that I, I have some peak of adopting innovations maybe about a quarter or a third of the way through my life in the community, and then it drops off toward the end. So there's our peak reaction. We, we call that the adolescent peak. Somehow, I'm very, um, I'm very um, innovative and, and I'm willing to adopt innovations at this stage in the community. And amazingly, this fact that there's a peak about a quarter or a third of the way through your life, life cycle in this online website, um, this peak is true however long you're on the website. So this is, this is people who write 100 posts, 300 posts, 
500 posts or, or 1,500 posts, however long they're on the community, the y-axis shows how likely they are to adopt innovations. They seem to be most likely to adopt innovations kind of a third of the way through their lifestyle in the community. They join the community, they're, they, they, they are very uh, um, willing to adopt things, and then they become maximally willing to adopt new innovations, and then they kind of slowly, basically stop adopting innovations. So summarizing, we learn the language of the community, our patterns rigidify, we're less likely to pick up on new norms, and we look like the older language. And this suggests, kind of by the way, that um, if I look at how, what the kind of language users are, are using at the beginning, I could actually predict um, when they're gonna leave the community. So we tried this. Um, Chris Potts built a classifier, which Chris often does. Um, and here, the idea was, well, I'll give you the first 40 posts of somebody, you tell me when they're gonna leave the community. Um, and by looking at the language that, that people use, we have a vast improvement in our ability to detect that someone's about to leave a community. We can see how often they're likely to adopt someone else's lexical innovation, how similar their language is to, to um, their, their previous language, and so on. So why would this be? Why, um, why would language um, freeze in this way? Why do people just stop adopting innovations? And I don't know the answer. Um, but people have suggested some hypotheses, and we've been thinking about this, and here's two reasonable hypotheses. So one is kind of learning theoretic. It says, well, um, you, you're not really comfortable innovating until you actually know the language. So at the beginning, you're not gonna innovate as much because you're still learning. But then once you've overlearned a domain, you know everything about it, there's no functional reason for you to be learning more and adopting new things. You know how to use the language. Um, and the second theory that I like better says that no, it's really a, a more social explanation. It says, in order to learn, you have to be interested in learning. You have to care about the community. You have to pay attention. So attention and social investment matter. And if you're not investing and you're not paying attention, well, you're not going to really care about adopting other people's fancy new words, because you don't really care anyway, and you're going to drop out of the community anyway. Um, so in summary, um, we can use these large online communities as a, uh, to, to help study. Obviously, we still have to use real communities for all sorts of things. Um, so this is only going to help us solve, answer some questions and solve some problems. But still, it's a nice way to, to do some things that we can't do in, 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 in real life communities, which take 50 years. Um, and in this community, we find evidence for the same kind of things that sociolinguists have traditionally found um, for um, in real life communities. Adult language stability and adolescence is a period of the greatest adoption of innovation. Um, and it suggests that that although of course there's real adolescence and there's real adulthood and there's lots of real changes that happen in there as well, that even in this 10 year online community composed of adults already, that there's something about stages of life in a community that are like adolescence and like adulthood and maybe those are part of what's going on in human regular old adolescence and adulthood. Um, and understanding what these causes are and whether this idea that it has to do with attention and, and, um, and social capital and social investment um, is a fun future work. All right, so where have I gone so far? I had the catch-up theory of technological innovation, um, suggesting the role of communities in innovation, and then I had the language of beer, where we're able to look at linguistic innovation in online communities, and I wanna just do some more language of food. And I wanna draw, um, especially think about human social interactions, and I wanna draw on the Bourdieu, um, uh, introduced to me by, um, by Penny Eckert. Penny handed me um, Bourdieu's distinction and said, read this. So here's what Bourdieu did in distinction. He, um, he looked at French tastes for stuff in the 1960s, and he said it correlated with class. He said, so the working class has what we would kind of definitively call um, popular tastes. So the blue damaged walls and these heavy, starchy meals of cassoulet, that's what the, the, the working class ate in the 60s. And the high status class instead had these refined tastes. They liked the well-tempered Kabir, they liked Bruegel, and they liked all these new ethnic and health foods that were arriving in France right about that time, the curries and the brown rice. And what Bourdieu said was, there's nothing absolutely better about curry than cassoulet. They're both perfectly good. It's all about a way of distinguishing the upper class from, the, from the, the lower class. It's just a way of being different than them. That taste is just a way to mark your social status. And he said it very um, distinctly in, in um, this lovely sentence. In matters of taste, all determination is negative. And tastes are first and foremost distaste, disgust provoked by horror or visceral intolerance, 
of the taste of others. So what it is to have a taste is just not to be like those other people. And so we thought this would be a fun thing to check. And um, so um, this is a, my um, freshman student, Josh Friedman, in my freshman language of food class, um, decided to test this on um, advertising of potato chips. He picked potato chips because he liked potato chips. And, um, and we looked at two kinds of potato chip bags, expensive bags and cheap bags. And he did the study by going to the local supermarket, the Safeway, and taking pictures of all the bags because he was too cheap to actually buy them. <laughs> <laughs> and here's our corpus. All right, dirty chips, all natural, cholesterol free, and so on. And then we tested Bourdieu's hypothesis just by measuring linguistic distinction. We looked at comparatives, we looked at negation, we looked at words for unique, so no, and not, and never, and didn't, and all those, and we just counted words. Sure enough, um, the more expensive the chip, and we're talking about potato chips here, they're not, they're not all that different. Um, the more expensive chips, um, the more use of distinctive vocabulary, the more use of comparatives, the more use of these unique words, the more use of negation. And in fact, if you just measure linguistic negation, every negative word adds four cents to the price <laughs> for potato chips. And here's the most expensive potato chip bag. <laughs> So very um, the bags also emphasize health claims. Here's some phrases from the bags, healthier and trans fat. Um, but it turns out that even though all bags emphasize health claims, potato chips are clearly a health food, it turns out that um, expensive bags make these claims um, far more often. So for example, uh, uh, potato chips don't contain trans fats. You don't need trans fats for potato chips. But only the expensive bags say so. <laughs> Okay, so what, what, um, what our little study of potato chips tells us is um, that there's, there's some beautiful implicit linguistic markers of social, socioeconomic class. Um, that the role of health clearly more important in advertisers' minds for the upper class. And, um, and a beautiful um, test of the Bordeauxian um, model of attitude or other classes that we can see this in the linguistic negation, linguistic comparison. All right, so then we turned to another kind of advertising menus. This is a collaboration with Victor Chacuno, Brian Rutledge, and Noah Smith. The menus, menus um, um, what's fun about menus is you don't have to type in all the words because there's menus online. And we took, in fact, um, 6, 000, menus from 6,000 restaurants online, 5 million words, and asked how they encode um, these kind of economic, socioeconomic differences. So we looked at the, the words on the menu and the price of the restaurant um, in which the menu appeared. And so here are some facts. The, the more uh, middle price the menu is, the longer the description of the dishes are. So here's a description from a middle price uh, menu. Crispy golden brown Belgian waffle with fresh fruit. Lots of beautiful adjectives, crispy and fresh. Um, and, um, and because I'm a scientist, I have a graph. And, uh, so along the x-axis we have um, dollar signs and along the so you know a cheap restaurant uh, the middle price restaurants your expensive restaurants and here's uh, along the y-axis I just have mentions per menu and you can see lots of these beautiful sensory adjectives in those middle priced two dollar sign restaurants. Um, by contrast, the expensive menus are um, have less of these beautiful descriptive words, less adjectives in fact in general. So why would this be? Why would expensive menus be short and middle price menus have a lot of these adjectives? And there's an obvious um, answer, it's because grice. <laughs> so why would I say that a food is fresh only if you need to know the food is fresh? And why would you need to know it's fresh? Because you're not sure if it's fresh. And if you're not sure if it's fresh, that's a bad sign. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an expensive restaurant, I don't want you even thinking, don't, don't want you to go there. And um, those of you, those of you Griceans in the room, you're probably all at the experimental pragmatics meeting today, but those of you who happen to be in the room know that there's lovely links between game theory and Gricean pragmatics. Um, so I'm going to tell you the game theoretic explanation for the same effect. So the game theoretic model is, imagine that there's um, three classes of something, let's say it's restaurants, and let's assume that you, you have some other noisy cues to how good the restaurant is. Let's say it's, it's, um, it's price, or it's location, or it's decor, and you want to know um, who what kind of linguistic signals should we optimally use? Um, so what happens is, game theoretically, the mid-price restaurant signals, I'm great, because um, to show that they're not the same as the low-price people, because 
the low plant people maybe they can't say that their food is fresh because maybe it's not fresh. So the mid price restaurants say, we're great, our food is fresh. And now the high price restaurants, they can't say that because you might confuse them with the mid price restaurants. So they do what's called in the game theoretical literature counter signaling. So they, they don't say that their food is fresh so that you'll know that they're not mid price. All right, and we can see the same um, Gricean behavior by looking at the word real on menus. So um, here's who talks about what's real. In one dollar sign restaurants, real whipped cream, real mashed potatoes, real bacon. In two dollar sign restaurants, we go up to real crab and real maple syrup, and expensive restaurants just don't use the word real at all. <laughs> Obviously because they want you to, to believe that if they give you something, it is real. And, and as a little aside, a little historical aside, we can use this to actually study the introduction of artificial foods into American cuisine by looking at when the word real appears in menus over time. This is the New York Public Library has this lovely historical menu corpus. Um, and so you can see um, over time, um, you know, in the 90s we talked about real bacon. That's when they introduced fake bacon. And in the 70s was real whipped cream and real sour cream, not the various fake versions, and in the 60s, real butter. And um, if you all go all the way back to 1900, it was real turtle because they had mock turtle soup back then, and real German beer because the Germans had just arrived in America, and it was very exciting that there was things with hops in it now. <laughs> um, we, uh, the beer before that was all ale, so what we think of it, you know, lager beer now, didn't arrive in America until, you know, 18, 80 or so. Anyway, so, okay. That's what, so middle price restaurants use all of these fancy adjectives. What do fancy restaurants do? They use rare words, long words, um, and in general, things that are hard to figure out and maybe difficult to figure out. <coughs> and Michael Silverstein has a lovely paper pointing this out in, um, in uh, uh, wine tasting vocabulary. The same idea. We're using these fancy words um, not because you need to know that you're eating Tomarelli, but because you might not know what Tomarelli means, and that, 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 um, that's a, you know, a lovely thing that we can do. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, you can again measure um, uh, something about the, the, these long, morphologically complex words. Um, you can just measure word length, um, which we did, and sure enough, um, every time you're adding a letter to the average word, you're paying 18 cents more than the dish that has that, that layer in it. Um, another aspect of modesty, we can look at, um, at just the length of the menu, something pointed out in a lovely paper by Robin Lakoff. So here's um, the most expensive restaurant in San Francisco. It's called Cezanne. They had no menu, but I mailed them and, uh, and uh, emailed them and asked them to mail me a menu anyway. And here's what they mailed me back. Um, just one word per, per dish. <laughs> Abalone, sea urchin. Brassica, no brassicas, not cabbage, but brassicas, nice fancy word. Here's um, a sample, cheap restaurant menu, cheap <laughs> factory. Notice lots more words. And of course, that's just page one and two. There's 20 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and then as an aside, um, going back to frame semantics, um, we could think about, um, about menus as providing this lovely economic um, source of data. So take the word treat. If you look up treat in a dictionary, you see something considered choice to eat. And if you look at the use of treat on these menus, we get um, freshly baked treats and, and mini, mini Mexican treats. Um, it turns out that treats are only used in inexpensive restaurants for small, inexpensive products. So it's only in a very expensive restaurant that you can say that um, lobster is a treat. So this is a very, very fancy restaurant to talk about lobster as a treat. In general, treats are these small, inexpensive things. And we found this out just by measuring the average price of items that had the word treat in them. So really, we should define treat as something small or inexpensive, considered choice to eat. So in summary, um, expensive menus are, there's a technical term in the advertising literature, modest. They're linguistically modest. Um, they, they don't brag about themselves. There's a Gricean reason for this, and, and in our society, at least now, it's not, a, it's not a necessary thing. We can be more or less Gricean in different ways. Um, at least right now, modest advertising is a way of displaying luxury status. And also, um, like Fillmore's work in the, in the Santa Cruz Lectures on Dixis, he talks about ways in which space and time and social interaction uh, can provide um, um, domains for us to talk about lexical semantics, we can think of it economics as something we should be really working on, um, just like the word treat. Um, I wanna, um, now I wanna talk about 
uh, menus is a, is a way of, of food professionals writing about food. I want to talk now about amateurs writing about food. And I want to start with, um, with framing in restaurant reviews. So I've shown you a restaurant review here. Sorry if this blocks your, your, your reading of it. Um, this is a negative review. This is from a study where we looked at almost a million online reviews. I'll give you a second to read this review. I've changed some of the words to make it ungoogleable. <laughs> So you'll notice that the review is um, a negative one. Those are more fun, obviously. Um, and doesn't mention the food at all. No mention of the food. You'll see. Um, instead, it's all about, about we had to wait, and she didn't make eye contact, and we waited, and so on. So we looked at the language of these bad reviews. And here's the three um, things that we found. Lots of, as you would expect, negative sentimental language. Um, lots of, um, uh, we used Doug Viber's um, has a lovely corpus linguistic study um, on how to f and on which factors um, occur in the narrative genre. So we looked at past. We found his factor very strongly: past narratives about people, words in the past tense with lots of pronouns and lots of lots of third person pronouns and lots of mentions of people um, with all of his narrative features. And we found unusually frequent mentions of the words we and the words us. So we were ignored until we flagged down a waiter to get our waitress. And it turns out there are other narratives with this exact language, narratives, uh, genres, in which you use past tense, um, we and us, um, they have negative vocabulary and lots of narratives about people. And that genre is text written by people suffering trauma. <laughs> um, the James Penney Big Lab has worked on lots of cases of people being traumatized after 9-11 or campus tragedies. And they use exactly these um, linguistic characteristics and in particular, they use the first person plural um, as if he suggests to seek solace in community. This bad thing happened, but it happened to us. We'll get through it together. So in other words, one star reviews are trauma narratives. <laughs> and the deeper lesson of these reviews is it's really all about personal interaction. Our, our, we think that these reviews are just um, objective descriptions of the food, but they're really telling us something about uh, personal interaction. Now, that's negative reviews. Positive reviews, on the other hand, um, tend to be about sex. <laughs> but only for expensive restaurants. There's expensive. So sex, not, not to be had cheaply. What is cheap? Um, <laughs> cheap restaurants, we talk about addiction, we talk about crack, we talk about craving. So um, the cheaper the restaurant, the more likely you are to describe it in the language of drugs. So why this drug metaphor? Um, it's used, we looked at what it's used for. It's used for junk foods. So chicken wings and french fries and pizza and chocolate. Um, and obviously we feel guilty about eating these things. Um, by the drug metaphor, um, obviously it's, it's a negative thing, so it's a way of thinking about something negative. But more than that, by, by using the idea of addiction, it's, it's, it's sort of eliminating our control over this thing. I, I, um, I ate this cupcake, but really I was addicted to cupcakes, and so it's not my fault I ate the cupcake. It's the cupcake's fault. I was addicted. It was an external agent. Um, and sure enough, women who we know are um, much more pressured to conform to, to models of healthy eating are also more likely to use this metaphor of drugs. Um, men, um, by contrast, are more likely to be traumatized. <laughs> Um, and so that's food reviews. Now, what about if you ask for food? It turns out people on the web ask for food. Um, so suppose you wanted to study a lovely social question. What language um, do people use when they make requests that are successful, requests that get, they get the thing they asked for? And the problem with it's a very hard thing to study. How do you study um, successful requests? Obviously, it depends what you ask for. Um, so what we did is ask, could we just look at requests when they, all the people asked for the exact same thing, which that seems a little crazy, who on the web would ask for the exact same thing in different words? And it turns out there's a Reddit for this, where people ask for pizza. It's called Random Acts of Pizza, and, um, and so there's 20,000 requests for pizza on this site. People ask for pizza, and people give them a gift certificate for pizza. And we looked at the linguistics of the requests. So here's a request. Give you a chance to look at it. It's a very sad request. I'm sorry, the downer here. So the girlfriend has injuries and unemployment problems. Can you need to help us out. Here's somebody who really wants, needs the pizza. So, um, so 
Uh, what did we code linguistically? We looked at um, reciprocity. So there's, uh, there's a huge literature in sociology on generalized reciprocity. You reward people who do good things for the community in general. So I promise to return the favor. Um, reciprocity theorists would predict that this person's gonna get the pizza. Um, we can look at length, did they write a lot of things? We can look at evidentiality, did they um, show pictures of their bank account being empty? <laughs> this is from an actual um, request for pizza. Um, and so you would expect um, an urgency, obviously some of these urgent words, this person is really needs the pizza. You can look at status, so Reddit has a status thing called karma. If you're a better person on the site, you're a better community member, you have more karma points. So we could, we could see if people who have more status, are they more likely to receive pizza? And um, sure enough, who gets pizza is predictable from the language. And the most important factor is this pro-social behavior. Um, the most important thing is generalized reciprocity. If you promise to give the pizza for someone else, you'll get a pizza. Um, and saying thank you turns out also to be very important. Other politeness markers seem not to matter at all, but thank you seems to matter. And, and status matters. If you're the kind of person that answers questions and helps out the community, you're gonna get a pizza. All right, so s summarizing. Oh, you can look, I'm running out of power here. Uh-oh. Let me just panic for a second. <laughs> So, um, what have I shown this last little piece on computing? So from menus, we saw the economics of modest advertising, and we saw this idea of using economics as a fruitful domain for, under, for, for lexical semantic study. From reviews and requests, we, we saw a little more sort of social psychology or, um, or um, sociolinguistic psychology, the linguistic science of trauma, our complex attitude towards food and how they're linguistically represented, and um, the rewards of pro-social behavior and language. So if I go back to Fillmore's original question, what can we learn from words, word meanings, word uses, and word users? Some generalizations we can take back beyond the, the things I've talked about, the details of the computational linguistics and, the, and the, um, the lexical semantic things we've learned, we can have some higher level takeaway messages. So one is that innovation in science happens when you talk to your neighbors, so please go talk to your neighbors. We've learned that to learn the language of a community, you have to be invested in the community. We've learned that people suffer when you're mean to them and are generous when you're kind to them. <laughs> and really these are all examples of the fact that you can tell what people really think if you just look really carefully at the words they use. I mean, I'll stop there and take questions. or identity, and we're back to the same question. Um, let's, th let's think of some experiments we could do. Um, I guess we could, um, we could um, look to see if they, um, let's say, post as frequently as they used to, or show other, um, other kinds of attentional behavior. Do they read, uh, they, they read maybe we could check if they, like, from logs if they read as much reviews as they used to, or if they write. So it, it does look like people as they age read, read less things 
and, and um, post less things. So that suggests that at least part of it is attention. But but I like your your identity model. And um, but how would we like positively test the identity model? How do we test if somebody? Um, I mean, I guess we could look at the language. They talk about the young workers numbers. Well, I wonder if they would correct other reviews. They see a new review, they oh, go nice. smell, and they go back to Nice. Aroma. That's actually a great idea, is looking for, um, for corrective behavior in general. That would be, a, not just in the sphere community, but that's a, that's a great social thing that you could do computationally. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hello? Oh. Um, I thought it was really interesting about the whole phenomenon of modest advertising for something that's more luxury. I'm wondering if that's kind of always been the case, or if that's been more of like a recent historical development. Great question. Yeah, so modest advertising is, seems to be a recent development. So if you look at menus from 100 years ago, they're very long and very elaborate. And there's been some lovely studies in the advertising community, um, not so much on language, but more on visual advertising. So um, you know, what, what does Cartier or Tiffany's do? They have these big, huge ads with lots of white space and a little picture in the middle. And they, um, uh, they looked at whether that was um, cross-culturally true. So they looked at, at the connotations of white space in ads in North America, in um, Hong Kong, and in India, and only in North America now was a white space, um, uh, was you know, being able to, to have this beautiful, big, empty, modest advertising, a sign of luxury. And they hypothesized that it had to do, that, it was, that, it was, that this happened in the 50s, and it had to do with modern art and, and architecture and, and modernism, and that modernism was somehow associated with the upper class, because modernist things were expensive, and, elite and that um, there was a shift somehow. And you can certainly see that in the menu. So the, that seems like a reasonable hypothesis. And that's, that trend simply just didn't happen in, in, in Asia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering about the, um, the linguistic innovation of the review that you talked about, how the first third, that's all the images that happened. And you had just, before that piece, you had talked about what the scientific revolution and or the scientific Yeah, my suspicion from just having been alive at the time is that you're right, but um, <laughs> but but I you know we'd have to check because it could be, yeah because because there were a lot of young people and there's a lot of old people and you want to look at the percentages, but we could totally check that. That would be actually very easy to check. That's a great question. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. You you emphasize the importance of government-sponsored workshops or conferences happening in that happened in 1988 and 1989, and I was a graduate student in the United States when I, uh, in 1988 and 1989, and I remember computer science professors, uh, enthusiastically told us that co uh, universities around the country were, were connected via computer for science science. I wonder if that kind of communication, difference in communication pattern uh, caused that change you mentioned. Wait, I, mean, I just didn't quite understand the last part about the communication uh, pattern. So, if at the time, the Universities, are, uh, more specifically speaking, uh, com computer science departments around the country are connected via uh, by computer. Oh, oh, you mean the actual the actual yeah, communication yeah. networks? Yeah. Uh, so you study, uh, com uh, you study the, literature, the, yeah, the, literature the ARPANET. Could of, uh, computational linguistic literature. If you study the si uh, other subdivision of computer science, you I wonder if you will find a similar result. Ah, uh, I like this. Okay. I, I see. I, so, so yeah. So if I could just restate or. Or, or, um, so um, this thing that happened in 88 with this revolution that was borrowed, could part of the influence be the, the greater networking of society and certainly the internet 
um, appeared in a lot of universities right around then, or, or propagated a lot around then, and departments were connected, and so could it be that lots of fields of computer science show spikes, or fields of other disciplines show spikes right about then, and that would be a fun thing to check. We have the web of science data, so we have um, all abstracts of all papers um, published in journals um, that, are, that are in the web of science, and um, so we could try to look at numbers of disciplines. It's, it's a very large data set, and we've had trouble kind of figuring out how to, how to crack it. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. the right data set to look at. Do you find any gender patterns in the peer review forums have changed patterns? You had gender information, I guess, the first part of the question, the second part is, was there anything you said? Good question. For the, for the beer reviews, we didn't have gender. Um, I, you can guess that, that um, our suspicion about the gender in general patterns in beer review sites, they're pretty, they're pretty male dominated. We, we did have gender for part of the Yelp study. So Yelp doesn't give out gender of their reviewers, but they, um, they um, well, it depends on the data, but, they, but reviewers have first names, and you can assign a gender to first names with some probability. Let's say for 90% of names, you can assign a gender. And so that's how we did the gender study on the trauma and the, um, and the, uh, and the, the food. But um, yeah, not in the viewer reviews, alas. Yeah, so right, to see if women are in fact also more innovative on, um, on the beer side would be the obvious thing to check. And um, we're looking at other sites now, we're looking at a, at a, to rule out absolutely for sure biological age, we're looking at a cancer, a forum for cancer survivors who are over 60. And so then we know those people are for sure all roughly the same age or at least in the same couple of decades and older. Um, and we, and we, have, we, we, we have first names for that data, so we can presume we can check. So you, uh, you notice that you can kind of predict when someone is going to leave a website or something. Is this something you can predict only with the hindsight of what the link is gonna look like in the future, or is this something that websites can start using on us to give us a little presence? The latter, the latter, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, this is a perfectly practical tool that, um, that um, yeah, you could detect that somebody is, um, is going to leave, and of course, the, the non-linguistic features are very useful too. If somebody just stops posting, they're probably going to quit. So, this, so um, I'm excited by the linguistic features because I'm a linguist. But but if you were just a company trying to predict who's going to leave, you would start with those features. But um, as you saw in our results, the language helps as well. Yeah, you could do better if you knew the language of the future. But but um, uh, when you were talking about trends in restaurant phrasing, menus, and such. Uh, you, you talked about price and effects where upper class restaurants can try to distinguish themselves and distance themselves from lower class restaurants. Uh, did you ever find any, any effects in kind of the opposite direction of people trying to, uh, restaurants trying to emulate more upscale uh, establishments in order to try and concern them? Yeah, I mean, this is um, this idea that, that, um, that uh, you know, prestige features trickle down, socially trickle down. This is, a, you know, Veblen said this. And, um, and uh, George Simmel, and so this is a, a, um, a familiar idea in sociology <coughs> that, um, and in some sense we see that in, in, maybe not in these modern menus, but it was, well, maybe it's in the modern menus too. So words like natural, well, here's my best example. So one of the uh, most important features of expensive restaurants is the provenance of the food. The fancier the restaurant, the more likely on the menu they'll tell you where the food comes from. And I've just started noticing that like McDonald's and Jack in the Box and are starting to tell you, you know, something about the farm that the food comes from. And things. So um, this is for sure tripping down. I think the use of French, so in the turn of the last century, the 1900, um, French meant a fancy restaurant. And then by when I was a child, French meant a fancy, meant a middle price fancy restaurant, but really fancy restaurants meant something else. But um, so I think the yeah, use of obscure French words would trickle down into those upper middle price restaurants. That actually does sound kind of familiar because I just saw a video uh, like about a week ago about um, how McDonald's does actually use real <coughs> eggs that come from a farm. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They've had a bunch of videos about provenance of their food to ensure you that it's actually made from food. Which <laughs> <laughs> should make you work. Yeah. I was just curious if there were, uh, there were members that leave the community, but there's that subset where they come back. I don't know, they, they go to AA no. and fall off the wagon. And do those show, do those people show different patterns upon their return and is there some innovation? Good question, we didn't check those. So basically, we only looked at people who just um, 
who disappeared. And so we didn't check the ones who had a big gap and came back. With 10 years, it might be hard to see. Uh, there might not be a lot of people who had a long gap and then came back. And, uh, but yeah, we just didn't check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does, yeah. does the username affect your likelihood of getting something? That's a great question. We totally did not look at that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, sh I'm sure it plays some role. I don't know if it's big or small, but, but, um, but you know, people are influenced by all sorts of things. Yeah, that's a great question. Wow, well, if there's no further questions, let's thank cool. Stan for this. Thank you.